my pleasure to introduce today's event in honor of Dan Everett. I've known Dan since 1987 when he interviewed for a job at the University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Linguistics. I was in a joint program between Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh Computational Linguistics, and Dan was interviewing for a syntax and morphology position at Pitt. Dan was striking for his fascinating material on several Native American languages, including Piraha, Wari, and Yagua. He was also striking for his attire. He wore old blue jeans, a worn out red t-shirt with a picture of a parrot on it, which had holes in it. <laughs> he was uh, a very cool academic. <laughs> he got the job, and I, after knowing him for a while, I asked him to be on my thesis committee because of his breadth of knowledge of language and linguistics, and his, his, as is his advising style, uh, which I've attempted to emulate over the years. And he ended up being my co-advisor uh, for my PhD thesis. And he was an enormous help for me uh, on his, for his detailed help on and advice on all the arguments and uh, work that I did in, that, in, that, in my PhD at, at CMU. And Dan, of course, was working with the Piraha at the time. And he invited me then, actually, to work with the Piraha in the 80s and the 90s. And I wasn't able to go at the time. He wrote a very famous The Current Anthropology paper in 2005. And he invited me again. And this time, I was able to accept. And I visited in 2007 with um, Mike Frank. Mike Frank, who was my then student, and in collaboration with Ev Federenko, who wasn't able to come. But we started some fascinating projects on number, number words in Piraha and syntactic recursion in Piraha as well, some of which may be alluded to here over the course of today. Um, so a little bit about Dan history, in case you don't know. Uh, Dan grew up in extreme poverty on the US-Mexican border. He and his mother lived in a trailer park, and she died suddenly of an aneurysm when, when she was only 29 years old. Dan was 11 at the time, and he had to go live with his um, estranged father who lived in San Diego, uh, who he did not get along with. He was uh, abusive, his father to say the least, and Dan spent a lot of time actually on the streets. In, uh, in 1968, Dan was actually selling drugs before a rock concert when he met the children of a missionary um, who were trying to help trouble, troubled youths like Dan. And, and uh, Dan went to the missionary's house for, for dinner, and soon thereafter met and fell, love, fell in love with the missionary's daughter, Karen, who were, Dan and he were both 16 at the time. Dan had never met, he told, told me that he'd never met happy people before. He was told that their happiness came from their Christian beliefs. Uh, and so Dan converted, and by the time Dan was 19, he and Karen were married, had one child, Caleb. Where's Caleb? He's here. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, who, and he's here, he's a, now a professor at uh, University of Miami. Um, Dan became a missionary, learned linguistics at the Moody uh, Bible School. He moved to Brazil in, I, I think, 1977 to work with the Piraha, by which time he had three children. He can correct me about the time course order of those things. Along the way, he got a master's in linguistics from Unicamp in, in Brazil. And he got the first PhD ever awarded in linguistics in Brazil ever in 1983, for also from Unicam. Um, if you don't know Dan, one of Dan's great talents is that he can learn a language extraordinarily quickly and well. He knows many, many languages and, uh, and sounds native in perhaps many or all of them. I mean, certainly many of them. I don't know about all. <laughs> I know that when I travel with him in Brazil, uh, Brazilians always try to figure out where exactly he is from in Brazil. They're surprised when he says San Diego. <laughs> and so he only learned Portuguese much later in life, and he sounds native. Um, so he's a, and he's also a rare linguist, actually, who can figure out the sounds, morphemes, and structure of a language, even with no bilinguals. And so that's what he did with the Piraha. Uh, and, and so he, and he's worked in many languages, perhaps most with the Piraha, where he started as a missionary in 77, and spent over seven full years working and living with them, um, by which time he became close to bilingual, um, more so than anyone else ever, according to the Piraha people themselves. Um, you know, although he went to the Piraha to convert them to Christianity, he likes to tell the story that he never converted any of them. Uh, in fact, he'll tell you that they helped convert him away from Christianity. Dan, Dan ended up getting divorced from Karen and Christianity and marrying Linda, uh, who he's been happily married to now for 15 years. Dan has published in almost every area of linguistics, in phonetics, phonology, morphology, sociolinguistics, so psycholinguistics, historical linguistics, syntax, semantics, philosophy of language, and philosophy of linguistics. He's uh, started as an assistant professor um, in Unicamp 
and then he moved to, in the 80s, then moved to the University of Pittsburgh in the late 80s, where I met him, and he's had several other academic positions, and culminating in his current position, which is a trustee professorship at the Bentley University in Waltham. We're local to here. Um, Dan has a great many academic achievements, only some of which I'm going to list here. So he has enormous descriptive work. Uh, he ha, you know, did, wrote a grammar of, of Piraha, wrote a grammar of Wari, and he does descriptive work in over around 20 languages of the Americas. Um, his phonetic work, he's done a lot of phonetic work uh, documenting new sounds in Piraha and Wari. Uh, he has several phono phonological results, which I won't go through. Uh, so as not to demonstrate my naivete in that field. <laughs> so I'm not going to try and say what those results are. Someone else will tell you about some related things later on, I hope, today. Um, and he's had important morphological work and language documentation work. And so he worked working with native speakers. He identified Orowin as a distinct language in the, uh, I want to say this right, Ch Chapakuran family. Um, the work that I know Dan best for is actually, as I mentioned, the 2005 current anthropology paper. Uh, where he documented, it was about Piraha, documented the first language to lack number words, one of the simplest kinship systems ever documented, the first language documented to lack origin myths, and possibly, most importantly, in some ways, depending on your perspective, this language was claimed to lack syntactic recursion, which was of theoretical interest uh, because of what Noam Chomsky had been writing about recently when this came out, and I'm sure we'll hear, I'm, I'm actually certain we'll hear more about this because I'll talk about this in a minute in my own presentation. Okay. Um, he also worked on linguistic anthropology. There's a book um, called Dark, Dark Matter of the, of the Mind from Chicago Press. And then his most recent work is coming out soon on the philosophy of linguistics. It's uh, called Charles Peirce and the Philosophy of Linguistics. It's the first study of Peirce's philosophy of linguistics introduces Peirce's theories of language and their consequences for linguistic theory. Um, not only has he done all these theoretical and descriptive pieces of work, but he's done some general public kind of work. He has three, well, maybe at least three books I know of, which are uh, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, uh, Language, the Cultural Tool, and How Language Began. These books have been translated into around 20 languages around the world. And, uh, and so uh, they're, they're lovely pieces of work on getting linguistics out to, the, um, to uh, regular people. Um, today, we have, uh, I, I don't know how many, 15, 18 people talking about projects that are related to work that, uh, that Dan has worked on over the years. And there is a website, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. If you don't, that's, that's what it is up there. And all of us, we're going we're gonna to talk for, you know, on the order of 20 minutes, 15 minutes plus five minutes-ish for questions for the people that are here in person. And there's like 15-minute talks, 10 minutes plus five for the Zoom. There's like five or six, six of those at, right after lunch. Um, it's a great set of speakers talking many aspects of Dan's research um, interests. Uh, and there will be a volume uh, coming out I hope at the end of the summer, all every single one of these people is writing a paper or has written a paper, and it will be coming out at the end of the summer, um, uh, I expect. <laughs> the timing on those is tough. Anyway, um, the, uh, so that's the introduction of what we're going to be doing today. And now, without further ado, I want to, um, so what, what is the, the rules here is I'm going to, each one of us now, for, we're going to give you a 20-minute talk, and it's, it's kind of aiming at 15 minutes plus five, and then there'll be lots of breaks and time uh, uh, to discuss um, at, at lunch as well for people that want to talk about other things that we uh, we don't get to in these talks. So I'm going to, without further ado, I'm going to go right into my little presentation, which is about um, uh, Dan's interaction in some ways with um, talking about uh, recursion, Chomsky's idea of recursion. So I'm going to discuss the notion of recursion, with which uh, Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch has famously proposed way back to be in, the, in 2002 uh, to be core in human language, okay? My claim, following on comments from many, but most prominently probably Jeff Pullum in 2020, is that recursion, or, or maybe more clearly labeled as syntactic self-embedding, is irrelevant as a feature of, la of human languages, okay? Um, human, sorry, sorry uh, Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch seem to be obsessed with allowing an infinite number of potential utterances in a grammar or a language, but I would argue that infinity is irrelevant to theories of grammar. What really matters is compression made possible by compositionality, you know, just the ability to combine components of meaning together in a productive system. Uh, it's irrelevant that there might be an infinite, you know, a, an unbounded number of those. You know, a large number is enough. 
to want co uh, compositionality. So what I'm going to do today is uh, uh, first introduce the notion of syntactic self-embedding or recursion that Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch proposed to be so central to human language. Then I'm going to digress for a moment to discuss what it means for recursion to be core, which is their word. Uh, in recent email exchanges with, with Noam Chomsky, I discovered that Chomsky thinks that Dan Everett intentionally mischaracterized what was intended in Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch. I think Chomsky's accusation here is incorrect. Um, that is, I think it's clear what was written what was written in Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch's paper, what, what is meant by what was written, it's clear. Everett and many others discussed those ideas appropriately given what was written. In current times, Chomsky seems to think he wrote something else as far as I can get, uh, gather from my emails with him, but he didn't, he wrote what he wrote, uh, and we're discussing that. <laughs> uh, and so then I'll move to discussion of Piraha, and as you know, uh, Dan Everett proposed that perhaps this language doesn't have the property of syntactic self-embedding. Um, I think this is difficult to decide. I'm going to summarize the evidence that I know of, which seeks to, to evaluate the question, and I'm just, I conclude that there's no strong evidence one way or the other. Um, but in, in the end, I'm going to come back to, you know, the, the sort of main point is that an alternative to syntactic self-inviting as being core is, is just compositionality in language systems allow, allowing compression of what we need to communicate. So a small lexicon and grammar immediately gives rise to astronomically large numbers of potential utterances, recursion or self-embedding has just been irrele an irrelevant sidetrack in the theory of grammar, I think. Um, okay, so let's just, uh, if I'm gonna go get through some of those things in a few minutes here, uh, let's, let's, I, I wanna like say what Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch actually said. Uh, here's a, here are direct quotes from their paper in 2002. It says, all approaches agree that a core property of the faculty of language narrow is recursion attributed to a narrow, to, to narrow syntax in the conception just outlined FLN takes a finite set, set of elements and yields a potentially infinite array of discrete expressions. The core property of discrete infinity, so I keep talking about infinity here, is intuitively familiar to every language user. Sentences are built up of discrete units. There are six word sentences and seven word sentences, but no six and a half word sentences. There is no longest sentence. Any candidate sentence can be trumped by, for example, embedding it in Mary thinks that dot, dot, dot. And there is no non-arbitrary upper bound to sentence length. In these respects, language is directly analogous to the natural numbers. Okay, that's a quote, those are just quotes from Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch. So in fact, you know, as is widely discussed afterwards, there's no definition of recursion. They just use the word, but don't say what they mean. They simply give an example and ask the reader to infer what they probably mean. I'm gonna follow Pollum here in assuming that a reasonable interpretation of what they meant by recursion is that is that in a language is having a syntactic device or devices that could in principle permit the construction of sentences of arbitrary length. And I'm gonna call that syntactic self-embedding. Syntactic self-embedding in the grammar gives rise to right or left branching structures of arbitrary depth uh, or arbitrarily center embedded structures. And we have lots of those kinds of structures in English such as possessives or clausal complements or, or coordination and so on, okay. Um, this is well known here to this audience that Everett proposed that Piraha does not have syntactic devices that could in principle uh, permit the construction of sentences of arbitrary length. Uh, and you know, Everett also argued that the features, the features of Piraha grammar followed from its culture. I, I am not gonna discuss that. That's an orthogonal question here. The grammar culture interface or whatever is not what I'm talking about here. It's just, I wanna talk about just what is the, the grammar generating, not why does it exist this way, okay? So even, but no, no, note that even with no self-embedding in the syntax, you can express recursive meaning. You know, Everett's been clear about, we've been clear about this all the way along. So the English doubly right branching embedded sentence, like John said that Mary told him that the Red Sox beat the Yankees. Yeah, it's, it's plausible. Uh, uh, can be rephrased as three separate utterances. The Red Sox beat the Yankees. Mary told him that and John said so. So the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch claim is about syntax of utterances and, Everett's, and Everett's claim is about the Piraha syntax, not meaning. There was a little terminological confusion as we're, you're probably well, well aware of, some people in this audience will be well aware that um, over the years, uh, what, what people meant by, what, what Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch meant by recursion, you know, Everett assumed the self-embedding uh, definition which allows sentences of our, an unbounded length. Um, an, an alternative definition is maybe compositionality or merge uh, and that's a, a definition that Nevins et al. Um, assumed. And 
I quote from them here, uh, in a model with category neutral merge, however, a language that lacks recursion would be considerably more exotic. No sentence in such a language could contain more than two words. Piraha is manifestly not such a language. Using, using their definition, there's no debate. As, as Nevins et al. observe, they're right, that's right, but that's Everett's assuming definition A, which is uh, you know, with syntactic self-embedding definition because that's what Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch wrote. That's what they said. So not merge, but the syntactic self-embedding. Um, an alternative kind of response to Everett's claim about Piraha is to claim that self-embedding may be available in all languages, but not all languages use it. This is Jack and, Jack and Doff and Wittenberg's response. They propose that there may be languages whose grammars don't result in self-embedded structures. In, in, in fact, uh, as of 2019, so relatively recently, this is Chomsky's claim about what he intended in Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch, according to a long e email exchange I've had with him. Uh, the way this email exchange got started was that I wrote to Chomsky asking if he had called Dan Everett fraudulent for some reason because Dan had been told by students that Chomsky had told them this. Chomsky replied, and I quote, the Piraha story is mostly fraud by fraudulently claimed to have refuted assumptions about recursion in language. Everett managed an impressive PR triumph, but nothing beyond that. So yes, Chomsky did say Dan was fraudulent, and, and several more emails identified that this fraud is a very non-standard use of, the fraud, of, of that word, in my opinion. Um, in particular, Chomsky thinks that Dan intentionally misinterpreted the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch paper. And I'm just going to dig a little deeper into why I think that's actually a mistaken claim. Uh, so in, in, in this email exchange, he stated that it was irrelevant that there might be exceptions to the generalization that he and his authors were providing. He said that the intended claim was not that recursion was universally used. It, Chomsky said that what was intended was that recursion is a universally available for all human languages. But the original writing doesn't say that. You know? So the writing, writing suggests that a universal property was intended. So here's, the, you know, I'm quote, the line, the, more, the, the core property of discrete infinity is intuitively familiar to every language user. That's a quote from Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch. It's explicitly about every language user, not about every English user, or every Mandarin user. This is a claim about all speakers of any human language. This was Everett's read of that paper, which I share. It's also every other researcher's interpretation I've ever talked to. Uh, I, I've even assigned this, this paper in the class, Howard Chomsky and Fitch, to ask what their interpretation was of this. And everyone gets the same interpretation. So I think it's absurd to blame Everett that for this universal interpretation of Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch. That interpretation is from that paper. It's not Everett's interpretation. It's everyone's. It's just what it says. A second response to Everett's claim has been to suggest that Piraha does have syntactic self-embedding in the same way that English does. Uh, Uli Sauerland suggests this is the case based on some experimental data that he gathered when he visited the Piraha. I'm going to say more about that in a minute. Before I do that, I just want to mention that I worked with, with uh, Richard Futrell and Laura Stearns and Steve Piantadosi and Dan uh, to analyze a corpus of spoken Piraha that Dan Everett and Steve Sheldon had gathered to see what the simplest syntactic rewrite grammar might be and whether that grammar had self-embedding. There we, we got uh, 17 Piraha stories and we parsed them as best we could, uh, talking to both Dan and uh, Steve Sheldon and looking at the resulting structures for evidence of potential self-embedding. Uh, we looked for all kinds of self-embedding in, in structures that might have, might have uh, that do, do have them in English, and we couldn't find any strong evidence for syntactic self-embedding in these categories, sorry, in anything we looked at. Um, there's limitations to our work. Uh, this is small corpus. There's only 17 of these stories. It's only a few thousand words. Uh, maybe it's 20,000 or 30,000 words. It's not very big. Um, and there's no control corpus, but we couldn't find anything that was uh, definitively uh, re recurse was, was syntactic self-embedding. So the closest is maybe reported speech, but it's easily, it could be analyzed either way. That's the only thing that was remotely close. Um, so in contrast to our work, to Richard Futrell's work, uh, Uli Sarland purported to have found evidence of syntactic self-embedding in Piraha by gathering interpretations of experimental materials. To do this, Sarland went down to work with the Piraha. Uh, and he had two native speakers record materials of the following form, which he then played other Piraha native speakers and interpret them and get uh, judgments on those, what they mean, okay? These materials had this form. There was two, one speaker, two speakers talking to each other. Speaker one, who was called Toei, who was his name, said something, and he said something weird. And he says, I went to the stars. I've been to the stars. And then speaker two would talk about what Toei said. And he said, Toei said something. I've been to the stars. 
And the dependent measure then is, is how people interpret that pronoun I, okay? So it's how you interpret what I is in speaker two's statement. You know, is it I referring to Toei? Toei said that I had been to the stars. Toei, Toei said I had been to the stars. Or is it um, uh, Toei said something and now irrelevantly I have been to the stars. <laughs> Some other person, is, this other, me, the second speaker has been to the stars. And so there's like, that's the subordinate interpretation where I refers to Toei and the coordinate interpretation where I refers to the second speaker. Okay. Um, and critically, the coordinate interpretation is like they're, it's false in this scenario. Uh, so because speaker two hasn't been to the stars. Uh, but what the embedded interpretation is true, because Toei did say that he had been to the stars. And so, so Sauerlin proposed that if people can get the embedded interpretation, if they get that one, then Piroha has syntactic recursion. And, and so he investigated that by asking people if these sentences were true in, in this context, true or false in this context, okay? And so I'll, there, there's some problems in the design here, but let's, I'll, I'll get to them in a second. Okay, here are the data. He gave us the raw data. So he gets uh, 16 participants here um, presented in, in, in this graph. This is the graph from his paper where each shaded square is a Piranha participant. And uh, there are 16 shaded squares and there's two that are hatched. That's, um, that's two people giving the same kinds of answers across the, the materials. And, and so what he's interested in, Sauerland is interested in, is the, the y-axis there, where how um, the, the more people that responded with a self-embedded meaning up high, there's more of those people than there are down below. The, the hatch marks, the, all the marks, are, they tend to be up. And so he said, Sauerland concluded that Piroha therefore has recursive syntax, because most people are getting the interpretation that Toei and I are the same person. Okay, so that was Sauerland's result in saying it has recursive syntax. Okay, there's two huge problems with this. One is that he first is, is like kind of experimental methodological. It's like, do they understand what's going on here, the, the people? And he actually had a control. So there's a, an x-axis here. The x-axis is a control, which is like, do they understand this task? Can they understand these materials? He has that control in there. And there's a, the y-axis, um, uh, people who understand the task are the ones who get more control right. Those are the ones on the right. Okay, so we should, Sireland should only be analyzing people who are getting most of these materials right, seven out of nine, correct, for instance, um, which is only six of the 16 people. Um, okay, when you analyze those data, participants are actually at chance. That's what the data we should have been analyzing. Those are at chance, okay? Uh, so they, you know, the people that understood the task were at chance on interpretation, okay? But the second issue, maybe is the one you noticed by the way I presented this, is that he assumed that answering true means that there's a self-embedded syntax, okay? That doesn't follow. That doesn't follow at all. You can test that in English easily. So I can uh, ask people the same, give them the same task in English and you know, make sure that there's no self-embedded syntax in the English as actually we did. So you can give them exactly the same kinds of materials. John says, I've been to the stars. Bill says, John said something, period, I have been to the stars. There's no syntactic self-embedding here. There's two separate sentences. And then you just ask, how do you, how, who's I? Is I John or is I um, Bill, right? And people overwhelmingly think I is Bill. Like, oh, is 98% of the time people said I was Bill on these things. So in spite of the lack of syntactic self-embedding, everyone agrees, or almost everyone agrees, that the, getting the embedded meaning interpretation in spite of no embedded syntax. So in spite of non-embedded syntax, people get that embedded meaning. That's contrary to his hypothesis. You don't, this is back to this thing I mentioned very early on. You don't need recursive syntax to get re recursive meaning. You know, you can get, it depends, the materials are very biased towards a, a, an embedded meaning. It doesn't mean there's no embedded mean. it doesn't mean there's no recursive syntax in Piotr It's just completely irrelevant to this question, okay? So, you know, my conclusion is uh, we don't have strong evidence we certainly don't have strong evidence for self-embedded syntax in Piroha. We have weak evidence against it, and that's the, the Futrell corpus. Uh, we can't conclude much here. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, finally, I want to go back to the title point of the, of the presentation. Is why did Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch focus on recursion? You know, self-embedded syntax. Um, their claim is, is, uh, is, is that being able to generate an unbounded number of sentences is a critical feature of human language, which gives rise to discrete infinity. They're obsessed with unboundedness and, and infinity. You know, but why should generating unbounded number of sentences be a useful feature for human language? The existence of potential exceptions to this claim, like Pierre Haas, suggests that human language need not generate unbounded numbers you know, some, to be useful as a communication system. I, I, I suggest that alternatively, maybe the useful feature of a, of a of, uh, 
of um, a syntax really is a combinatorial rules in la human languages is compression. The fact that having a grammar which with generalizations over categories enables us to convey our ideas more, our ideas more efficiently. So with categories of forms, just having words or morphemes and rules to combine them, I can convey far more meanings than if I associate each complex meaning with an independent form. Note that even with a finite language, we can convey unfathomably large numbers of meanings. So this is a toy example here. Suppose that there's 5,000 nouns in a lexicon, you know, far fewer nouns than we know in English, for example, among many other kinds of words. And, and suppose there's um, 100 different syntactic sequences, 20 words long, OK? And that's just a tiny fraction of what's available in any human language, OK? Um, and, and say there's 10 nouns in that sequence, such that um, each noun can go in any position. This will give rise to 5,000 to the 10th power, that's the number of nouns, to the 10th power in all those positions times 100 of these sequences, which is 10 to the 39th sequences, which is even ignoring for the flexibility of all the other words in the sequences. There's 10 to the 10th neurons in our brain. There's 10 to the 50th atoms in the Earth. <laughs> these are inconceivably large numbers. There's no need to appeal to infinity or unboundedness. You know, this is finite, and it's just big. Compositional grammar is necessary for compression, even for large finite sets. So recursion or self-embedding, I would say, is just irrelevant to this. And it's just been a big sideways uh, garden path, I guess. <laughs> and so um, that's, that's where I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> Do people have questions? I think I have, like, how am I doing? I got, like, three minutes or something? OK. So are there, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's why. Were there, are there any questions or comments or something? Just one comment. Yeah. I agree. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Again, oh, oh, we have a mic for people if people want to ask questions, actually. I should make sure we do this. Oh, Josh. Denimbaum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm probably the least expert in all of this stuff here, but I, th I thought the suggestion, I guess maybe this was from Jackendorf and, and Wittenberg about being available in principle but not used. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, is, is there, could there be some link between that and the fact that this is a small isolated language community? Like, y y is it a coincidence that of all the human languages that don't use in this particular way, this embedded syntactic categories, um, it ha one of the very few ones happens to be the, uh, you know, a very small isolated language. I mean, maybe we could say, well, that's why it just hadn't been discovered for a while. Or is there something about just, you know, maybe you need a larger community um, to, uh, you know, have that basic cognitive capacity get realized in, in the syntax? Yeah, um, that's a very interesting question. So that is basically, you're asking a, a very important question about the relationship between culture and cognition and c culture and language. And, and maybe, uh, so it's a very different claim than Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch's claim, right? right? And so the claim, and, and a different kind of claim would be maybe that things like the, the, the kind of compositionality, like um, self-embedding, gets discovered slash invented depending on what, what it is we want to talk about, right? And so the cultures. And, and there's like, so just, you know, the Peter Hunt, you might say, oh, it's a small, isolated community. Like, as the point out, there are 7,000 languages, you know, currently in existence. So most of them are like that, OK? So, you know, there are, like, most of the languages around the world are small, isolated communities in a way. And so, there, so most of the human languages, may, and we just have, we just don't know the details about how most of those languages are. We, we don't, so it's like, this is not, it's like, for instance, you know, another complaint, you know, that, um, you know, that Chomsky had in his emails about Dan and stuff was like, well, Ken Hale had observed Walpri as a language of, of uh, Austronesia, which apparently has properties very similar, he thinks, to, to Peter Ha. So this is another language that Ken Hale had talked about and, uh, you know, may, maybe has similar kinds of properties in some way. I don't know. And so, but I, I think it is possible that cultures with contact so David Gill is actually pursuing this. David Gill will be talking later on today. So David, and maybe other people, I think Dan, Ray, Ray has sort of comments along this way. Ray Jackendoff and Ava Wittenberg have comments about this kind of idea that maybe as communities grow in various ways, you know, so David Gill's claim, one of his interesting, I find fascinating, is that as communities grow and they need to interact more with other communities, especially in, a, in a, some kind of official way, like political, 
and needing, then that is when the language gets more complicated in various ways. So that's a cultural, it's a very different kind of claim than these other kind of claims, but so I, I think that's a really fascinating um, uh, line of research, which, which David will, I don't know what he's gonna talk about actually, David Gill's talking later today. He's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, where's our time in here? You're in charge. Mm -hmm. We're out of time. I'm so sorry. You can switch and then okay. do a question while yeah, yeah. Okay. Where, where's my yeah, Jeff? You should be switching with me. Oh. Please. Thanks. Great talk, Ted. I just should wanted to. Um, uh, in, in, no, to what ex hey, uh, to what extent, in your opinion, um, this is a, the, the insistence on recursion on infinity is a methodological point. That is, how do we know that uh, there are combinatorial open-ended combinatorial system if it doesn't exhibit the capacity for infinity. So my understanding of Chomsky is that this is probably why I insisted on this nope. point. Not that it's necessary. It's this one. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm double, I'm <laughs> dual tasking here. I know. <laughs> so what, what, sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> Number one, great talk. Number oh, two, oh. linguists makes for really bad language research. You made the point. Number three, the main point is, um, my understanding of Chomsky, with all his shortcomings, is that the insistence on infinity is not practical but methodological. Namely, how do you know that you have syntax with the capacity for, for, uh, uh, for with algebraic capacity, basically, if you don't demonstrate that? So I thought that's the, the uh, utility of this observation. What's the point of infinity again? I don't understand the point of infinity. Say we don't have any infinity at all. We just have, we, we, we don't ever do a syntactic embedding. Why do we, syntax doesn't need, like why do I need that? I don't understand. His argument doesn't make sense to me. Like I don't understand why we need to care about discrete infinity because if why. It, Because this is our, our litmus test that the uh, computational mechanisms are, sim are such as he proposed. That was, but I guess it was But that's well, circular. Hmm? I mean, isn't that circular? I mean, no. I don't care what he thinks. I mean, I, I, I care what he thinks in, in to the extent that there's something that I can test in the world. Right. But you're not giving me something to test in the world. You can't tell me I, like, then he gets a parallel well, natural numbers. The natural numbers aren't so, even like language, and so that's like wrong, and so I don't know. The, what. the project is to characterize the, the scope of linguistic de generalizations, and yeah. they show that oh. there are, cannot, that they go beyond the set of, um, features that are tested in uh, speaker's experience, and that's something that's testable, that you can go and actually evaluate. But you don't need recursion or infinity for that. You don't need that at all. That's like generalization over categories going to other yes. new, new, new compositionality. That's irrelevant. So that's why I say they Agreed. Okay. okay. Agreed. Okay. Jeff. Jeffrey Pollan, please. <laughs> Sir. Thank you. I'm going to be talking about this man and uh, what, what happened to him and whether he deserved it. <laughs> I mean, look at him. You can tell. You see the shifty eyes? This is a mean, twisted, no good scoundrel. When he discovered the Pirahant people in Amazonas state, they were living a peaceful, happy life with none of the troubles that we have, like income tax. And then he comes along sticking microphones in their faces and so he can exploit them and become rich and famous by lying about their subordinate clauses. It was an interesting <laughs> business plan. Where did this nonsense come from about him? It came from this article in 2005 when he first said, Peter Hahn just doesn't have these things like subordinate clauses, multiple coordination and so on. I'm taking exactly Ted's view we are as one on this, that the way to make this a serious issue is by talking about whether you can make sentences of arbitrary length. And his claim was that in this language, you really can't. None of the devices you would need are there. Numerous earlier works had discussed languages like this. This is the point you do not find in the literature very much because it means having read about typology for the last 50 years. Tommy Gavon, by 79, was putting it in very direct terms, answering the question that was asked over here. There are some languages extent to this day, all in pre-industrial illiterate societies with relatively small homogeneous social units, where 
The subordination does not really exist. It's a completely general claim about there being hundreds of languages like this. But certainly the literature looks to me as if it suggests that these languages, not in none of which I am expert, are candidates that probably you cannot demonstrate how sentences of arbitrary length will be constructed in any of these languages. The literature is there. It was sitting on library shelves for decades, and it didn't provoke any fury. Everett even told Chomsky about it in 1984, pointed out that he knew a language that didn't seem to have any of this embedding and arbitrary length sentences, and Chomsky thought it was interesting at the time. But look how long ago that is. What had changed by 2005? The appearance of this paper, probably mostly written by Hauser, and then co-signed by Chomsky and Fitch. Um, there's a lot of biology in it. But along with it, as Ted just said, is this statement that there is no longer sentence and this idea is familiar to every language user. No non-arbitrary upper bound to sentence length. That's what Dan, Dan had noticed. It's been discussed in terms of recursion, which I'm just going to avoid completely. The term is used so vaguely by linguists that uh, it just makes a, a mush. But it was standard generativist dogma. By 1968, Langacker was saying almost exactly the same thing as I can imagine Hauser just copying it out of Langacker's textbook, and putting it in there, because it's standard linguistic think. It's ridiculous to say that it wasn't. Epstein and Hornstein say it even stronger in a defense of the Chomskyan program that dis discrete infinity characterizes every human language earlier in the year when Dan's paper came out. He was saying they're all wrong. Hauser, Chomsky, Fitch, Epstein, and Hornstein had said something wrong about human languages. So what followed was an 18-year campaign of vilification, slander, and attempted career damage. Instead of a discussion and a collaboration to figure out where's the disagreement here and is it empirical. Andrew Nevin sending out a mass email to try and boycott a lecture in this department at MIT, ending with sarcastic advertising language about how you can enjoy the spotlight. Just find a remote tribe and exploit them for your own fame by making claims nobody will bother to check. That was Andrew Nevins in 2006, November. It started really there with him. By 2007, Silene Rodriguez, the third co-author of the Nevins, Pesetsky, and Rodriguez paper in language, had a more serious tactic in mind. She wrote to Funai to get Dan banned or declared not a fit person to do research in Indian areas, and it worked like a charm. It had worked years before, five years before, with uh, Napoleon Chagnon. His enemies did the same thing, got him banned from visiting the Yanomama. So now Everett couldn't make research trips to the Piraha area anymore. So that's got the competition muzzled. He can't get any more field work done. In 2007, Dan, because people, newspapers were printing stories about the dispute now, and he got invited on NPR's talk program on point. I was on that show when I was here in Cambridge for a year. Dan turned up at the designated radio station, as promised, and was turned away. An MIT professor called Pazetsky had been talking to the producer. 2009, February, is when Chomsky said, really angry at being asked yet again about Everett, what's this stuff, and so on. He was really getting furious, and he told Brazil's largest circulation newspaper that Dan had become a pure charlatan. Remember, he'd been told in 1984 about the lack of embedding in Piraha, but now he's saying this is a charlatan it, as Ted mentioned, he's claiming that Dan deliberately misinterpreted a paper in order to make himself famous with the newspapers. Uh, if it were that easy to get famous, I think I might do it. 
Selene Rodriguez then told, in late 2009, told Malta Hank, writing for the German magazine Geo, that Everett is a racist. He puts Piraha on a level with primates. Now, since she's a primate, I'm assuming she meant monkeys and apes. <laughs> when Tom Bartlett of the Chronicle of Higher Education asked Nevins if he could would submit to an interview for an article that uh, Bartlett wrote about this growing dispute. Nevins wouldn't be interviewed, but he did email back, it seems you've already analyzed this kind of case, and appended a link to a story about Diederich Stapel. He was the biggest con man in academic science, according to the New York Times. A confessed fraud, he gave his uh, PhD certificate back to Amsterdam. 58 of his papers have, in social psychology have been retracted because the data was just made up. Then Brazilian linguists started spreading rumors that Dan worked illegally with no permit. I was told this very firmly in Brazil in 2019 by Danny Moore, an American linguist who lives there. Uh, if you think about it, if Dan was a scofflaw who would just work in the Indian areas without a permit, then the ban that Rodriguez accomplished in 2007 wouldn't have worked. It's only because he obeys the law and gets permits if he can get them. Anyway, the police did show up once. Armed police showed up whenever it was there with a couple of other researchers. And they were happy with the documentation he showed them and they they posed for a photo. <laughs> they didn't arrest him. Look at those guns. Everett's behind the camera. They could have taken him out. <laughs> in 2013, Nevins, together with two other people in Brazil, made a video in which a, a guy named Augusto, nicknamed Verão de Roy, falsely represents himself as a Piraha political leader. They don't have political leaders, but uh, that, was the, that was the claim. Um, and did invented translations from Piraha, which he doesn't really speak. Uh, he didn't grow up in a Piraha village. Um, and what he tells is stereotype stories about evil American missionaries threatening the Indians with death uh, that God will kill them if they don't convert and become uh, true Christians. And then they organized a conference devoted entirely to showing that Dan was lying. In Rio de Janeiro in 2013, he offered to attend and wasn't allowed. By 2017, when he offered to give a lecture for free at Oxford, it had to be canceled because junior faculty expressed worries about damage to the reputation of the university if the lecture took place. Oxford University, the oldest university in Britain and often ranked first in the world and it would be, its lip, reputation would be wrecked if, if ever it spoke there. I mean this, you shake your head and think, what is going on? What planet am I on? The Rio conference resulted in a book Dan's enemies heard that Everett and Gibson were reviewing it. They did a very level-headed uh, analysis of it. They pressured the editors of language to allow a second review article. So it's the only book known that's had two review articles in the same issue of language. Um, several people didn't want to do it, but Norbert Hornstein agreed. The cause of all of this was a claim that Chomsky had heard direct from Dan 20 years ago. I'm afraid it was partly my fault that Dan had given the impression in 1986 that there was some subordination in Piraha. Des Derbyshire and I commissioned him to do this big long article for the Handbook of Amazonian Languages and we did stipulate that uh, people who submitted descriptions to the book should follow our guidelines and section 14 in the guidelines said subordinate clauses have got to be discussed. And so Dan obediently strove to find some. 
we, Des and I should have known better. Des had already said that Hishkariana simply didn't have them. Nominalizations filled the slot that you would expect subordinate clauses to fill in a language like English. And there weren't any signs of you could embed nominalizations inside nominalizations. You can't actually tell noun phrases from clauses that easily, even in English. There is dispute to this day about whether the line between clauses and NPs comes after two and before three, or between three and four, or after four and before five. Five and six are surely uh, noun phrases. That I've contributed to that literature, and incidentally I've expressed two different points of view on opposite sides of it 20 years apart because of Rodney Huddleston convincing me that uh, three and four are too similar to have different root categories. Dan was looking at Peter Haas sentences of this sort, where there seems to be a secondary predication, but we can't really tell whether it means Ko'oi already told the child to cut the grass or already told the child to do the grass cutting. I'd say with things like this, does it mean he really knows how to make arrows or he really understands arrow manufacture? I don't know how to tell the difference between a nominalized construction and a pure subordinate clause, and Nevins, Pesetsky, and Rodriguez don't know either. They trawled through 125 pages that Dan had written. This was one that they seized upon with glee and said, uh, this is, we really got him here. He doesn't want me to go with want at the end and the I, not, I go embedded in the middle. It's before the matrix verb. Unfortunately, they were disadvantaged here by their policy of refusing to contact Dan Dan currently thinks, uh, has checked with Karen Medora, uh, who, to whom he was formerly married, uh, about this example. She said, your view is correct when he put it to her that he now thinks it might be ungrammatical. Was that right? She believes it's not a grammatical sentence, and she's in contact with the Piraha to this day. The, I am going to run out of time in 60 seconds here. Um, the book, Recursion Across Domains, perhaps the worst book on syntax I've ever seen, does have a, a single chapter in which the authors, noting that English NPs, like the coin on the paper on the chair on the board, have that kind of nested structure, they imagine that Piraha must also have such structures, but the other way round, because it's head final, they say, not realizing that Piraha is not head final in noun phrases. The noun comes before modifiers, and if you put modifiers after the head noun, you'd get, because that's what he said about the structure of noun phrases, you'd get self-embedding, the money, paper, chair, board, on, 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 which, of course, doesn't occur in Piraha. It's ridiculous. Probably their informant, who they think said, uh, Yes, that's fine for me. And they, they had various tasks the informant had to do. The informant was probably just taking the PPs one by one, not embedded structure at all. They even tried to get the informant to repeat back a sentence. And the informant repeated it, but with the PPs in the opposite order. And to my astonishment, they treated that as spontaneous evidence corroborating them. And again, you shake your hand head and you think, what is going on? What planet am I living on here? So I agree with Ted. I'm not claiming infinitude is scientifically significant. I haven't said the set of Piraha sentences is established as finite. I'm very strongly inclined to think that Dan is right. But there's plenty we just don't know. And instead of collaborative work to resolve it, we've witnessed 18 years of linguists, attacks, accusations, and straightforward libels. Dan has been banned from doing the crucial further feed work that really only he and Karen could possibly do. Linguists just seem to have lost their moral compass on the matter of uh, what they've said about him, what they've done to him. He's done more for Amazonian linguistics than anyone else now living, as far as I can see. 
And he's shown us what grace, strength, and forbearance looks like because he's never responded by accusing his enemies of bad stuff, dishonesty, bad character. I salute him for that. We all should. There, that shows you can do it 15 minutes with only one or two minutes of override. Uh, and I didn't even eat up the entire question period. The silent question period in which no, Caleb. Maybe this gets to Ted's point, too. I mean, self-embedding, as I recall, in English discourse isn't really that common, right? I mean, it's a pretty rare thing. This seems to me another thing that gets missed, is well, that it's not such a common thing. This is where we get uh, into the, the details. If it's chained subordinate clauses on the right-hand end of the sentence, it's common enough, and we do it all the time. Center embedding is a different matter, and that's always produced great conversation, great comprehension difficulties. So putting a, a clause in the middle of another clause with stuff at the beginning and stuff at the end makes for horrible comprehension problems. Um, but it's common enough in languages with a long tradition of literature to string subordinate clauses following subordinate clauses and so on. So it's not rare. Uh, what we don't really know is just how common it is to find languages where you literally don't use subordination at all. Marianne Mithun has something on that, I think, which is worth uh, looking at, and said so in a BLS paper 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I think, are we ready for Van Valen? Or do you want to well, there's allow questions. me to take another yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's fine. Why do you think that uh, people haven't engaged with any of the other languages that have been reported to lack of recursion? Because it's so difficult under the constraints of a university professorship in the United States to do what Dan was able to do which is to spend years in contact with a people in a tiny village who only speak their language, to get to know that language until you are fluent in it and make that study. It simply can't be done. Not far from you is Joan Mailing, who used to be the NSF program officer for linguistics. See if you could get an NSF grant that would support you for enough time to work on a minority language like that in a tiny little uh, community far away and learn the language well enough. Linguists have not been prepared to commit themselves to it. And since I haven't either, because I wanted a career, I don't think we can even look down on them for it. We were just lucky to have Dan Everett, who had done this, initially as a missionary, but we shouldn't forget, very soon after that, since the Brazilian government at the time was saying SIL was no longer allowed to preach and convert people in the villages, Dan had to sign up as a graduate student mainly so that he had a legitimate reason to stay in Brazil learning that language. He was a graduate student, he was gonna write a PhD, and then he was a researcher. He wasn't a missionary for all that long, he remained a member of SIL, but then half their job is Bible translation. No, I think we've got a real institutional problem. We have not made it possible to do the extended field work that it would be critical to do. Only the NSF program on in documenting endangered languages is really prepared to help out with that. Their budget is small. Joan will tell you about that. Uh, and it's being chiseled away at and eroded within NSF and NEH to this day. Now, we haven't got the infrastructure to allow the necessary kind of research. That, that's in the US. So in Europe, 
you know, as I suppose well aware in the MPI with Levinson and so on, there was a lot more work done than that. So, and so other others have, you know, so maybe that's the sort of history here, right? So in the in North America, less possible. Thank you very much, Jeff. This is yours. And now, Robert. Robert Van Valen will. Okay, I'm not going to talk about PETA, huh? Uh, I'm going to talk about how language began, giving Dan's suggestion in his book a theoretical interpretation. Um, while full-blown language is generally agreed to be a property of Homo sapiens sapiens, there is tantalizing evidence that points to earlier humans having some kind of communication system much more sophisticated than animal systems, yet not as complex as modern language. Everett summarizes this evidence in how language began, so I will just mention two pieces. The transmission of the knowledge of the sophisticated techniques used and the manufacture of certain stone tools seems to require linguistic instruction. So anthropologists have tried to teach others how to make, for example, Acheulean hand axes by just demonstrating it. And they have failed and had to include linguistic instruction. And the ability to cross non-trivial bodies of water using watercraft built by Homo erectus would seem to require a sophisticated means of communication. The discussion that follows is agnostic as to whether the communication system attributed to Homo erectus was manual or oral. The discussion will proceed as follows. The first section introduces the complexity hierarchy of grammars assumed by Everett. The second section presents a sketch of a role and reference grammar analysis of the system which Homo erectus might have utilized. The third section concerns the role of information structure even in communication systems as simple as this one and the implication for conclusions about Homo erectus. The fourth section briefly touches on how a system like that of Homo erectus can evolve into a grammar on the hierarchy of grammars introduced in section one. Complexity of grammars, a hierarchy. Everett proposed three types of grammars which are hierarchically ranked in terms of complexity, G3 being the most complex and G1 being the simplest. G1 is called a linear grammar since it only allows sequences of expressions without any embedding. For example, man see deer, man spear deer, deer big. G2 is termed a hierarchical grammar because it allows embedding of, for example, a modifier inside of a reference phrase. For example, man spear big deer, where big deer is a embedded modifier. And G3 is a recursive hierarchical grammar, the complex grammatical system characteristic of modern languages. Everett suggested that Homo erectus had at least a G1 grammar, and that will be the focus of this presentation. <clears throat> On page 198 of How Language Began, there is a role and reference grammar tree diagram illustrating the structural complexity in a G3 grammar. It represents one of the four projections of a clause posited in RG. There are constituent, operator, information structure, and prosodic projections. Only the first two were presented here. So this is the constituent projection. Um, its essential components are the nucleus, which is the unit containing the predicating element, in this case a verb, the core, which is normally the location of semantic arguments of the 
predicate in the nucleus, although in this example, one of the semantic arguments is a question word, and so it occurs at the beginning of the clause in what's called the pre-course slot. The core also is modified, potentially modified by an adjunct in the periphery, primarily expressing location or time. And then the clause contains the core in its periphery and a pre-core slot. The did is not attached to anything in the constituent projection um, because it expresses uh, grammatical categories, tense and illocutionary force tense by its form and illocutionary force by its position. And so did is connected to the operator projection and lexical arguments and modifiers are connected to the um, constituent projection. What would a sequence of utterances in a G1 language possibly look like? Consider the following mini discourse. Near river, I see deer, it or deer, big, I spear it or deer. These can be represented as a sequence of propos independent propositions. The first thing to note is the lack of syntactic categories. The categories are all semantic. RE is referring expression and is not phrasal. Pred is predicate and prop is proposition. A proposition consists of a predicate and its arguments. The order of elements is not significant. That is the fact that the verb is medial. It could be initial, it could be final. There are no adjuncts modifying the proposition or any of its constituents. When a, when a location needs to be mentioned, it is expressed as an independent locative proposition analogous to the independent attributive proposition involving the re referring expression dear. Lexical modifiers, as noticed above, would be represented as independent propositions. What about non-lexical, that is, grammatical modifiers? These are known as operators in RRG, and as shown in Figure 1, they are represented in a separate projection of a, the clause, the operator projection. It is highly likely that there are any grammatical modifiers of this kind found in a G1 grammar of the type positive for Homo erectus. Hence, there would not be an operator projection in the representation of utterances. However, there are two operators which are found in the grammar of every G2 and G3 human language and which must have been part of any possible Homo erectus G1 system, namely negation and illocutionary force. Negation is essential for reasoning as well as for important speech acts like negative imperatives and warnings. The ability to make assertions, ask questions, and give commands is an essential part of any human communication system. Both can be expressed through non-grammatical means. IF can be signaled prosodically, while negation can be expressed gesturally. So an example of gestural expression of negation uh, comes from my daughter who, when she was four, was asked, do you like zucchini? And she said, me like zucchini. When asked to repeat, she said, no me, no me like zucchini. But the first one is the interesting one because the negation is a gesture modifying the 
proposition. Hence, these two operators would not motivate an operator projection in the structure because they're not expressed by segmental entities. Section three, information structure, argument realization, and cooperation. In the hypothetical G1 example discussed earlier, um, after the first, in the G1 example discussed earlier, after the first mention of a referent, there are three possibilities for subsequent mentions. Repetition of the referring expression, using a pro form or simple omission, as is so often the case in many G3 languages today. Option one requires no special machinery. It is the most redundant. Option two is the least likely, since the development of proforms would seem to be more likely a trait of the advanced systems. The most interesting option is three. It was argued in Van Valen 1990 and Van Valen and Lapola 1997, following Kuno, Bollinger, and Bickerton, that information structure plays a central role in the analysis of intracentential pronominalization, regardless as to whether it involves overt proforms or zero anaphora. For example, a referent cannot be realized as zero if it is part of the actual focus domain of the clause, but can be if it is part of the background. So in the earlier example, it would be nonsensical to introduce the deer using zero coding. Hence, overt occurrence versus omission would very likely not be beyond the means of homo erectus. Hence, possibility three is very much an option. If Homo erectus is sensitive to some aspects of information structure, then this has significant consequences for the issues raised at the outset of this discussion. It was argued in Van Valen 1993, following Kempson 1975, we're going back into history here, uh, that the notions of topic and focus which are fundamental in to information structure, are ultimately derived from Grice's cooperative principle and the maxim of quantity, which are general, i.e. not domain-specific, rational principles of human behavior. Cooperation is a hallmark of language users, and despite the fact that it is certain that Homo erectus did not wield the cooperative principle in the same way as modern G3 language users do, it is necessary, it is nevertheless, was a necessary part of Homo erectus cognition. An example where cooperation would be vital is trying to reach islands separated from them by a significant body of water. Cooperation is essential in the constructing and operating of the operation of the primitive watercraft on which they traveled and which their lives depended. The transition from G1 to G2. A G2 grammar would differ from a G1 grammar in significant ways. To begin with, the combination of adjunct modifiers and referring expressions yields reference phrases which are necessarily syntactic because an RP potentially consists of two or more units which are not of the same semantic type. So you have an attributive predicate functioning as a modifier of a referring expression. In the same vein, the occurrence of syntactic RPs in a proposition triggers a reanalysis of the proposition as a syntactic entity. 
a core. In addition, the occurrence of adjunct modifiers taking a propositional unit as an argument, so I see big deer near the river, which could be represented crudely as near the near river speaker see big deer, further motivated the reanalysis as the predicate plus argument units are now functioning as an argument and filling a slot in the proposition that could also be filled by a syntactic entity, namely an RP, big deer near river. The pred underwent reanalysis as a syntactic nucleus due to, among other things, the occurrence of syntactic entities as the predicator. So speaker, good hunter, I'm a good hunter, where good hunter is the predicate in the nucleus. The introduction of embedding had profound implications. It created semantically mixed units, which led to the reanalysis of the fundamental, fundamental semantic entities as syntactic. So this takes our G1 representation and turns it into um, a syntactic representation. So the combination of big and deer creates an RP which is syntactic, and so the basic proposition speaker C deer is reanalyzed as a syntactic unit with semantic motivation, of course, and the locative proposition is reanalyzed as an adjunct modifier of the um, basic proposition, speaker C, big deer. In this brief talk, I have sketched what an RRG analysis of a G1 linguistic system, which might have been employed by Homo erectus, might have looked like based on the account given in Everett's book, How Language Began. Dubbed a linear grammar by Everett, it would specify a linear string of propositions which would be semantic in nature. There is nothing to motivate the positing of syntactic categories or structure. Of particular interest is the role of information structure, which gives evidence that Erectus had rudimentary understanding of Grace's cooperative principle and at least the maximum of quantity since it underlies the important notions of topic and focus. There is little agreement among researchers investigating primary cog primate cognition as to whether non-human primates have shared intentionality, i.e. the ability to recognize conspecifics as being intentional and mental agents. It is clear, however, that early humans, including Homo erectus, had shared intentionality. They were, so to speak, Gricean apes. The transition from a semantic G1 to a syntactic G2 was briefly discussed. It was argued that the introduction of embedding into the grammar led to a transformation of the grammar from being essentially semantic to being primarily syntactic. Thank you. We have time for a question or comment or two? Yeah. Oh. Oh, uh, can you give that, that's great. Can my, my? Um, I have a question about um, the shift from G1 to G2. G1 seems, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, so I have a question about the shift from G1 to G2, because G1 seems pretty powerful. And I'm wondering what kind of pressures you think may have uh, moved in the direction of G2? Like, what was G1 not sufficient for? Um. That's a good question. 
Um, Dan, you have an answer? Well, I, I can suggest uh, an answer. So in, in my work, the purpose of grammar is to help people infer what the meaning is. And the advantage of a more specific grammar is more aids to inference as to what the meaning is. So with a G1 grammar, if you're in a very simple environment, what Tom Givon has called a society of intimates, where everybody knows everybody and they pretty much share common knowledge, inference is relatively easy based, and you just need, a f you need fewer cues. But as society becomes more complex, uh, inference becomes more difficult because the knowledge base extends and the complexity of the syntax narrows down the inferential range. That's the way I develop it. Thanks. I have a very basic question, which reflects my lack of understanding of what a G1 is. So you, I see how, how powerful it is for assertions, but I wondered Could if it can make... Up a bit? Sorry, can, G1 looks very powerful for assertions and descriptions, but when you say that all of its components are semantic, can it distinguish between an assertion and a question? Oh. Um, I didn't mean to exclude pragmatics. I was basically making the point that the basic propositions describing events, um, there's no motivation or justification for saying that these things are syntactic since they're related directly, the units correspond directly uh, to units of meaning. Um, I assume that even at a G1 level, negation and elocutionary force are present, and elocutionary force would be signaled prosodically right, rather than uh, grammatically. So when I say they're semantic, I don't mean to exclude pragmatics, at least rudimentary pragmatics. Okay, th thank you very much, Dan. <clears throat> and now we have the last uh, talk of this session. There'll be a break after this for something like 20 minutes or half an hour. And this is, hey, I'm just gonna set you up there. Okay, thanks. Um, great to be here. Uh, this talk is about several things which have interested Dan over the years, um, including field work, work with an isolated community, and, uh, and a campaign against recursion. Um, so, uh, so let's get going. What I'm doing is I'm also against deduction in my case, right? So I'm inducing rhythms from recorded oratory, oratory being spoken literature. Of course, literature doesn't make much sense there since it implies literacy, which is absent in this community. So it's oratory. This is an accepted term. The data are well-defined speech registers <clears throat> and re with uh, re reproducible real-time recordings. So if you want them, you can have them. The method is quantitative physical measurement, signal processing, data comparison with hierarchical clustering, and modeling conventions or research uh, questions that rhythm consists of beats and cycles with frequencies and magnitudes and other properties. There is a systematic variability in, uh, linguistically systematic variability in rhythm patterns. There are multiple parallel rhythms of rhythm. I have an article on this in JIPA um, 2021. And uh, they provide the, the what I'm, I'm offering provides physical grounding for linguistic correlates of rhythm, particularly at the discourse level, um, and because the rhythms do appear to be heavily dependent on contextual style, uh, register, and I'll be comparing different types of uh, of spoken 
spoken stories, actually, reading on the one hand with oratory on the other hand. So th this contrasts with linguistic discussions of rhythm as deduction from grammar. I won't go into all of these details. One of the differences is that um, the discussions are often based on normative educated registers, not extempore speech, um, metalinguistic uh, quoted written transcribed data, uh, individual expert opinion, qualitative judgments and analysis, and rhythms as relations between nodes and structures um, <clears throat> as partly reversible numerical tree encodings. Um, partly reversible, I actually wrote an article on, on, on the, a long time ago on the um, uh, compound stress rule, uh, on the inverse compound stress rule. Um, and uh, physical grounding is not regarded as essential. Well, I take the opposite view. So let's take a look at real-time rhythms, and where better to start than West Africa, where prosodic phonologies originated with Firth, and of course many distinguished linguists have worked on West African languages. Um, <clears throat> and what I'd like to do now is take a look at rhythm from the point of view of three types of person. And two of these three types are types which Dan has um, uh, has uh, represented over the years. One is the, what I like to call the phonologian, um, rather than, I believe the accepted term is phonologist, but uh, I think your early career phonologian is not, not bad, is it? Um, and the musician, of course, which Dan also is very much so, uh, and, and the radio engineer, uh, which is one of my, uh, is, is part of my history actually, but I'm sure you had a lot to do with radios in the Amazon. Um, so maybe that'll count as well. So let's move on to this. Um, <clears throat> the phonologian is concerned with lots of, and the phonetician concerned with lots of things, including prosody, and there including intonation, and pitch, accent, and tone. On the one hand, and um, the sonority curve, this is an unusual way of referring to this, the sonority curve, the phonetic correlates of the sonority curve on the other hand, which we've come back to. The musician is obviously concerned with these things, melody and rhythm. Um, melody at two levels, first of all, um, uh, sorry, rhythm, let's concentrate on rhythm at two levels. First, uh, the, the usual rhythm of bars and the notes in the bars and sub-bars and things like this, uh, but also things like tremolo, which are very fast rhythms, which are maybe comparable to the rhythms provided by consonants and vowels and so on. And the radio engineer is concerned with conveying things like this, signals like this, information signals, with a carrier, uh, with a carrier signal uh, by means of modulation in two ways. One is frequency modulation and one is amplitude modulation, which you're familiar with from radio. But this applies to speech as well. This is modulation theory applied to speech as well. So when you talk about intonation, you're really talking about frequency modulation. And when you talk about uh, uh, rhythm or vowel consonant sequences and timing and so on, you're really talking about amplitude modulation. Anyway, where are we geographically? We're in Africa, in Cote d'Ivoire, in, in Ivory Coast, and we're in a little enclaved community called the Ega community. They speak the Ega language, which is putatively a Kwa language. This is controversial, uh, but it has many, many uh, similarities with um, <coughs> Kwa languages, and we were doing field work uh, some 20 years ago, <coughs> actually in the in the, in the sort of Oxford of the, the Ega region, Nigidugu, uh, which is a prestigious uh, village, the chief of Nigidugu is the chief of the Ega. And um, where are they typologically? Well, Ega is closely related to the other Ivory Coast core languages. Um, I calculated this using Levenstein distance over phoneme inventories. Uh, very detailed phoneme inventories in the Atlas of the Languages of the, the um, Atlas des, des Langues de, de Côte d'Ivoire, uh, published um, in the 1980s. And Ega is, way out, is, is, is an outlier. It also has similarities with the Cru languages, but they are, <clears throat> they are different. Still, um, let's move on now to, uh, I'd like you to join me um, in the village with the community, the narrator, and the caller, because we have um, call and response parts in the, in the story here, and the audience consisting of, uh, of children and the older ladies. The younger uh, adults are working in the fields. This is during the afternoon, um, and normally the stories would be told in the evening. 
and uh, the back channel responder who plays a very important role in encouraging the narrator by saying thing, things like, oh yeah, wow, or oh, you don't say so, or bullshit, oh, sorry, this is, <laughs> or this is the USA, <laughs> so I'm allowed to say that, I think. Um, and the field workers are in the foreground, foreground here, sort of almost invisible. The first story you'll be hearing is, um, you'll only be hearing, well, the story you're hearing is the first story, and the uh, narrator was still a little bit self-conscious about the camera and so on. He keeps looking towards me behind the camera. Um, so here we go. <laughs> And he's uh, actually, the video, was, the video was supposed to be playing. I don't know why it didn't. Um, so the parable is well, terrible, really. A faceless young bride-to-be left her promised bridegroom. She's fruitlessly warned by a twittering bird. That was the song. Um, but the girl didn't understand because she spoke Ega and not Dida, the enclaving language, and the bird was twittering in Dida. Uh, and the, um, the bride and the jilted suitor met along the way, and they had, they had a quarrel, they insulted each other, and he killed her. The moral is not, thou shalt not kill, but thou shalt learn other languages like the field workers. <laughs> um, the punchline being, of course, that the language was Dida, and she didn't understand it. Okay, let's, have, let's get back to um, research questions. Multiple parallel speech rhythms, not a single rhythm. Speech rhythms relate to linguistic units in cycles, uh, and there are, there are um, multiple levels. And these can be modeled as regular languages, hark the recursion people, um, and, uh, and represented by cyclical uh, finite transition networks. So this is the dialogue grammar. Um, on the left, we have a series of cycles, um, a hierarchy of cycles actually, with a narrative um, and, then, and, and then pauses, which are optional, um, and then the narrative again and again and again. Again, these are turns in the narrative. And on the right-hand side, we have um, the call responses introduced by a call and then response, then another call response, call response, as you heard actually, and then a pause, going back to the middle with another section of the narration. We don't have time for, for all of that. And the thesis here, which I'm representing, are that speech rhythms are metalocutions. That is, they are symbols, uh, signals, which denote units in the locution in the strict semantic in the strict semantic sense. For those of you who are into formal semantics, um, it wouldn't be hard for you to formulate a model um, a model of that. Units and their occurrence at temporal points and, and intervals in the locutions. So the rhythms actually point to the words that you're talking at, <laughs> talking with. Um, and in terms of pragmatics, uh, the rhythms depend on register style and discourse. Now, recursive computation is unnecessary. Well, that's good because recursive computation requires extend, extending and uh, maybe, maybe even non-finite memory, whereas uh, only iteration is required. This is an important computational difference. I haven't heard much about that in the discussion on recursion over the last 20 years. But uh, for any of you who've, who've done uh, programming with, um, uh, with recursive and, uh, and, and iterative fun uh, uh, functions, um, you'll know there is a huge difference because for iteration, you only need a constant working memory. You don't need a... Uh, you don't need a um, an, ex an extendable, potentially non-finite memory. So we have an inheritance hierarchy, physiological, behavioral bonding rhythms, bonding rhythms like dance, music, uh, waving, nods, handshakes, and other bonding activities, um, speech rhythms, uh, uh, and so on. And so the interesting thing about all of these rhythms <clears throat> is that they occur in a range, um, roughly speaking, between 0 0.1 hertz, namely I uh, intervals of 10 seconds, and um, 10 hertz intervals of 100 milliseconds. And the ones we'll be talking about are in the area just below 1 hertz, 0 0.3 hertz approximately. 
Um, characterization. A rhythm is perceived and can be measured when a series of similarly structured events occurs with a specific frequency at approximately equal, equal intervals in time and motivates a prediction of further similarly structured event after a similar interval. Um, and thanks here to my daughter Alex, who's an econometrician, and she said, that's Granger causality. Okay, I won't go into the details here, but it's like, you know, the, the rhythms in, as you're speaking, the rhetorical rhythms point to possible turn-taking turn -taking, um, uh, uh, times at the locutionary level. Okay, so this is very much like Granger causality. Uh, and rhythm has many attributes. I'll just be talking about frequency of magnitude, and actually none of these are talked about in linguistics, oddly enough. Um, so uh, speech rhythm in the frequency domain. Um, to get the frequencies, we need an FFT. To get the magnitudes, we need a, the, the peaks um, in the, which I call, which I call rhythm formants, because they do have linguistic function, just like uh, vowel formants do, except they're very low frequency. Um, uh, we need a peak detector for that. Um, the persistence. Rhythms have to have an extent in time, otherwise they're not rhythms. And they have to have resonance. That's how, that, that is, the frequencies have to remain um, stable, otherwise they're not rhythms. Um, so this is how it goes. At the top we have um, the speech waveform. In the middle we have the, um, the amplitude extracted, the amplitude envelope extracted by folding over the negatives into the positives. And the um, uh, this is uh, amplitude demodulation, and frequency demodulation is what you recognize as a pitch curve or an F0 curve. Um, but I, I think it's, um, it's helpful to regard all of this from the point of view of modulation theory, because it does help to bring a certain unity into areas of phonetics which are often regarded as totally distinct. Um, and this is the result of the FFT <clears throat> applied to a whole utterance. Okay, not a 10 millisecond window, but, but maybe um, a, a window of five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, and, the, uh, and what happens here is that the, you get um, high magnitude uh, fr frequencies around about 0 0.3 hertz. Um, you also get a group in the, in the middle, immediately underneath the red arrow, which are, are the rhythms of phrases and words. Uh, sorry, the words are the next group to the, um, to the right, and then you get little rhythms of syllables and vowels and consonants and constant timing. You know, if a syllable, if a syllable is rhythmical, then so are the consonants and so are the vowels, right? Um, but if you, that was the narrative. Now, if you look at the choir, then you get two types of rhythm there. Uh, one, and they're in an octave relationship. It sounds strange maybe to think of octaves at, this, at these low frequencies, but it's true. The, the one is twice the other. The one is the repetition of the call-response call exchanges, like call-response, call-response, call-response. And the other is the, the um, repetition of the calls and responses. So call-response, call call-response, call-response. And therefore, you get two rhythms there. You might think this is odd to call them rhythms, but I'm sure music, musicians wouldn't because you can have very andante rhythms, which are you know, three seconds, five seconds, uh, whatever they happen to be, and, and of course, repetitions. OK, now I'm supposed to stop, so I'll just, um, <clears throat> uh, I'll just flick very quickly through, through what we do with these um, uh, what we do with these rhythms. First of all, a spectrogram to get the temporal information. The two bars there correspond to the, in the spec low frequency spectrogram, to the rhythm across the, um, <clears throat> uh, across a period of time at two different frequencies. And um, the comparison which we then do between languages uses spectral, uses vectors of spectral properties. Um, and I'll just show you the results of that. So on the right, you get the two readings. Um, on the left, you get a, a cluster of different orator uh, recordings. And in the middle, you get the Ega, where it says Ega Kant 1, is, um, that, that is the first in the series where the, the, the reading which you saw, which was slightly stilted in relation to the others, where drums and music and clapping, clapping and laughing and so on also occurred. Um, and and Kant 2 is the, um, it, was, it was very short with very little, little variation in rhythm. So that's how, that looks very interesting, these uh, major groups here with a bridging <clears throat> item. And as hierarchical clustering, we get um, 
uh, we get, we, we get a, a little bit more detail. So let me just move, uh, move along very uh, quickly. There are some interesting points here, like the Anyu speakers cluster together regardless of the, style, of the register or the style, whether it's reading or orator. Um, that's a slightly different clustering with Manhattan distance. The other one was cosine different, uh, distance. Um, and I think these are viable methods of <clears throat> looking at relations between languages at the discourse level, um, based mainly on, on, on styles and so on. So the conclusion is simply a repetition of basically of the, of the hypotheses at the beginning, so I won't go through that again. The moral of the story, you have to have a moral for a story in the Ega country, combine fieldwork with music and philosophy like Dan does, but also combine fieldwork with music and engineering. Thank you. I'm afraid you'll have to speak very loud because I don't hear very well. Oh, Adele Goldberg. Um, thank you very much. This was really interesting, and it's really nice to see work on rhythm um, in language. But I, I wondered if you could say a few words about the the claim. Are, are you claiming that that different communities use different rhythm packaging when they narrate stories, so that there's a conventional aspect, or are you? arguing that the particulars of the rhythm convey particular functions. Right, well, well being jet-lagged and adventurous, I would say um, that rhythms are shared across communities, uh, that you don't get a, a sort of language typology in the sense that, that you would get with, with, um, with phonemes, a lexicon, grammar, and so on, but it's very, very style dependent. And so you get, um, I found this looking at other languages like, um, like Mandarin and Cantonese, uh, other African languages, other European languages, English, German, uh, and so on, that they tend to cluster in terms of style and register rather than in terms of the um, linguistically, you know, linguistic typological properties. So, it, so my answer is no, really. <laughs> well, or yes, because style and register are, are, are functions. You know, they're conveying that. Well, well, yes, but I mean, many, many linguists are kind of obsessed by sentences rather than, uh, sure. rather than discourse. Sure. So uh, okay. I'm really emphasizing the discourse level. Um, but perhaps I should, I should also emphasize this very important computational um, issue with recursion. Recursion is computationally very expensive, and uh, iteration is not. Uh, and um, if, this, if this recursion, you know, I mean, anybody who's programmed in Fortran or C or Python or whatever will know that. It takes forever with recursion, uh, and it's quick, if the problem is, is, is uh, suitable, of course. Um, and anything which is right branching can be done iteratively by a finite state um, automaton. Or left branching, not if it's mixed, of course, because then you get center embedding. But I've done a lot of work on English uh, corpora, uh, and I have only ever found one example of a reasonably successful attempt at center embedding in spoken, in spontaneous spoken extemporary discourse um, dialogue, and it failed. <laughs> it broke off. I, I'm, uh, I'm Dan Everett, and um, I, I uh, wanted to know if you had um, tried to connect some of the rhythms. I mean, in some of the discourse genre, probably this wouldn't be as relevant, but one thing I find in Peter Ha discourse and other discourses I've looked at in other languages are themes within themes and, um, and how those are marked. Uh, that's an interesting point. That gets the, uh, the, the that, that would aim at the relation between rhythm and, and semantics, right? Um, I was just looking at the relation between rhythm and form, uh, basically, uh, on the one hand, and rhythm and discourse role on the other, which you could call it semantics if you like. Many people would call it pragmatics, but you know, something functional. Uh, and um, I haven't looked at that, no, not really. Uh, but it, that'd be an interesting topic for for somebody's um, MA thesis. 
Okay, my name is Peng Qian. Um, that was very interesting. I have a very naive question. I wonder if the rhythm, because it, it seems to me this rhythm is constrained by physiology, right? Because you can't speak in certain way, or you have to speak in certain way that's constrained by how you articulate sounds. And I wonder whether that rhythm as, uh, could provide a constraint on the kind of structure that language would use to packaging words um, and therefore influence syntax indirectly. Um, just in virtue that you can't say a lot of words in a fast way or, um, or package a lot of words in, in one second or something like that. All right. Well, it's, I, mean, I don't. Thank you for the question. It's um, that's an important point. I can't say yes or no to it, but it, uh, but it, can't, it surely can't be a, co a coincidence that the um, that the rep that the occurrence rate of words, for instance, is approximately the heartbeat. Um, you know, I can only speculate about these things. I I, I would have to ask my neighbour, the cardiologist, if that's really true. Um, but yeah, uh, they're physiologically constrained. Um, how far, I mean, like this with the scale that I mentioned at the beginning from 0 0.1 hertz to 10 hertz, it's all within that range, isn't it? The, the, the brain waves, the, uh, the overt behavior, um, uh, you know, basic behavior like walking and running, it's all around, around 1 hertz, basically. Um, and and the the bonding behavior, which um, and Dan would say, all of these are semiotic in one way or another, but of course different types of semiotic relationship. Um, so handshaking, why do we wobble our hands when we, you know, when we shake hands? Um, why are you nodding, you know, <laughs> at at a frequency uh, which is which is approximately observing you now a, a frequency approximately. Um, uh, two hertz. <laughs> a very interesting question, yeah. And I hope people will solve this question at some point. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We have a break now, and there's uh, coffee out there, uh, which is available for anyone who wants it. And we'll, we want people back at 11. Is it? It's 17 minutes. 11 o'clock, we'll restart. 17 minutes, there's coffee there. <laughs>